Hello, hello, folks. I want to invite you here to uh, not only go through the things I'm going to talk about, thinking, oh, this happens in my team, oh, this could be something, but I also want you to especially think about yourself in the context. So either you are a manager or a scrum master or a team coach. So let's get started. And I want to make sure that I give you the way of the land here. I just want to make sure that you no, we're going to talk about the teams. Then I want to talk about how you yourself, your postures, your ways of being can make a difference in all of that. So let's talk then about the, the success path. Um, this is something that I've come to realize that it's, it's uh, not a trademark thing or anything, but I, I you know, as a, a former developer, I learned that there are two things. One is an algorithm and that never worked with people. In search for answers, you could, you know, always repeat something, repeat a sequence of steps. That's an algorithm. But there is heuristics. If, if there are some developers here or some philosophers, you know what I'm talking about? So a, a heuristic is more like the guidelines of the strategy to do something, but not the tiny little steps because people just can't respond to recipes. We are absolutely unique. I know that people say like, oh, those millennials, they think they are snowflakes, but genetic shows that we are actually all very unique. So <laughs> even, even for you know scientific ways, we, we can show that we are all absolutely one. So this is more like a guideline. Look at this, like this is not a, a rule. It's not hard and, and, you know, and written in stone, but it's something I've come to, uh, to use for, for quite some time now. And uh, I'm, I'm really sold that it's kind of like a stepping stone of the things that you need. And inside each of those, you, um, you, you go figuring things out for your team. And the first one is trust. So we start there because it's foundational. It's, it's something that um, it doesn't matter if we're talking agile. It doesn't matter if we're talking co-location. It's, you know, do, do I know your intentions? Do I trust you? That's really what's important. And that's, that's where we start. And it's not a binary thing. It's more like a, a scale, a gradation. So, you know, you, you grow in your level of trust, level, level two, level eight, um, which means it's something you have to constantly keep working on. Just think about your acquaintances. Some become friends, <laughs> some don't. And, uh, you know, it, it's just how it goes. Some people you will trust more. It's not just about that... Uh, team building session, right? Hey, let's put the team together. Let's get to know each other. It's super fun. It's an activity that we do. I encourage you to do that, but it doesn't end there by any means. And it's not like doing those activities all the time either, but working on trust, working about building safe spaces and trust happens at every interaction that we have. You know, when you act with integrity at everything that you do and you tell your team, I say, I'm going to do this and I do this. You're just building trust right there. So we want to operate in a way that we embody that. And one of the things that help to trust in the scope of teams is, who is my team? <laughs> is, is it clear when someone is, is a visitor, if you will, or a, a stable member of the team? So knowing these things allow me to bond properly with, with my teammates. So this is actually a, a much neglected piece. Um, I've been working with a, a couple of teams recently that it's kind of like, a, oh, but that person is coming this sprint here, um, but they are not members of the team. It's, it's quite the conundrum and that makes it harder for, the, for trust to, to happen with the whole group. And nobody knows where they stand. Are we really committing together because you're not with us next sprint? So if you don't finish your task, what happens then? So. It, the team composition is a big element, actually, of, of trust. Also, trust being all-encompassing. Um, the, the team also needs to trust their manager. So know that they are safe and taken care of. How do we do that? And teams need to trust other teams and trust that they will be open to share information and to collaborate and trust that the stakeholders hold a great vision for creating the product. So, so trust is, uh, is really paramount here. And no matter what you do in your career, you have to know your technology to reach high performance. It's just that simple. And you have something that I, either you master or you're on, path, on the path to mastery if you want to make a difference. Um, and I, I have seen in the software development world, agile teams that do not master their engineering practices. 
that is it. No, no, that team, you know, we have to fix that first. Like, how do we, how do we work on growing the knowledge of our team members? Because you can have all the trust in the world if you don't know how to um, build your product with quality, you know, in the, the state of the art. This is not something to be neglected by any means. So just if you pick up running right now as an adult, I can tell you with total confidence, your very first run is going to suck. And then after you work on how do you eat? How do you sleep? What best clothes work for me? How do I train? Once you, you master that technology of your running, you're going to be such a, a great runner. So it, it's kind of like that. So it's the same if you're in a marketing team, in a software team, you have a technology that is inherently to your domain, to your industry, and that needs to be mastered. And then we trust each other and we know how to do our work, but do we know where to go? So the definition of success without it, everything is so vague. It needs to be clear. So the whole thing I was saying in the beginning, and it happens a lot, throw people together, call them a team. What's my mission? I think one of the speeches most known today is JFK saying, we're going to the moon, right? And, and he explained, and the mission is very simple. Everybody can understand, we are going to the moon. We don't know how we're going to get there. That's that's something we'll discover. So we nobody was confused about the moon mission and nobody was confused about their part on the mission either. So that really involves what the, the clear boundaries, the clear expectations on where we want to get, how we're going to get there. And to get there, then you have to measure. I don't see that very often um, uh, in, in many places that I arrive. I feel like uh, we don't measure the right thing if we measure anything at all. So what do I mean here? Um, wanting to get pointed on that one is that the, if you know Peter Drucker, he was kind of like the one of the creators of management as a science. And he said, if you can't measure, you can't manage. And he's right, right? It, you can think about the running thing. Like if you don't know where you're running bad, uh, what is affecting your running, it won't improve that running. But then think about two things about measurement as well. And the first, I guess that I want to say is, what we measure, the context for what we measure is not static. So take number of defects, for example. We, we, we definitely want to keep that low and we keep decreasing that. And now the team is super high performing. We keep the a very minimum level of mistakes. But now we're introducing a new technology. So we're still measuring the same thing. The numbers will change, will probably be higher. But in the context that we are now, we are not alarmed we know it's not desirable, but we know it's, you know, it's just part of the game and we're going to bring that number down. So measuring doesn't mean get desperate. You know, the numbers are high. Uh, you know, what do we do? Well, they are high in this context, not going to be higher forever. So think about that. Another thing as well, that you're, you're, what you measure will change over time. So number of the facts feel like the sort of thing you probably keep tracking forever and considering the context. But there are other things that you could just uh, um, measure that eventually you don't need to look at that anymore because that is so foundational that is implied. So if I bring you outside of technology um, and tell you that I learned how to uh, play the piano, I started uh, four years ago, five years ago. And back then I was really measuring how fast do I do my five finger scales? And oh boy, that was it forever. You know, just five fingers, not much stuff. And fast forward, many years now, I couldn't care less about that type of exercise. And now it's mm -hmm. all about um, how is my tone? How is my emoting? How is my interpretation? I measure, but I, I measure other things that implicitly tells me that my skills are just fine. So it's something to consider when you're talking about measurement. They will evolve. You want them to evolve. It's very dynamic. And But the, the love to measuring needs to be there. You need to continue to continuously measure to evolve. And then, of course, um, becoming good at iterating, that is the like heart of agile type of thing. That you know, love for measure comes in handy because you iterate in, in agile. And if you know the origin, iteration means learning. When you finish an iteration, there is always, always learning. And we learn on many personal levels when we are iterating. We, we learn on the personal level, we learn on the product level, and we learn on our ways of working. I was going to say process, but I prefer to expand and say like ways of working. So the highlight for you here is really, this is a prime spot for you to show up as a coach 
And it doesn't happen just as in the like a retrospective kind of time. And even please in retrospective. So I'm, I'm gonna say a little thing about like the iteration. Right? So the, the iteration ends for most people using Scrum at the Scrum retrospective. So when you're in the retrospective, don't let that be just about a funky board. Remember, you know, like the, this is a, a space for learning. So sure, there is the Halloween retrospective, the speedball, whatever. Um, I work with teams. Actually, there's one team that I work. They were absolutely addicts to those funky boards. And every couple of weeks, we had a two-week sprint. I was running after ideas and creating new boards for them because they, they were all a bunch of gamers. So that's really that was their language. But I'm going to tell you from my experience, my personal experience for with literally dozens of teams, that was the one team that really needed that. All the others, most software developers and, you know, C-suite and managers, they might like one or two, but that, you know, they don't have time for that. They're not interested in your funky retrospective template, you know, Miro stuff. Um, you can do something very different in, in these boards. They sometimes they miss the mark because they... Uh, they are more fun than they are practical. Once again, remembering that this is the context of learning. So bringing some very powerful questions or some data from the sprint or from the iteration that we just finished will cause a lot more impact than, you know, like, and not to mention that those very funky retrospectives, like it takes a lot of time to understand, you know, the dynamics, what's going to happen. So I think they are nice. But from ex my experience, uh, you know, they are not, uh, I find always surprising that people mention them a lot. They are not that hot when you're with a team of software developers or with a couple of, you know, of directors. That's really not, uh, not something that will incite them to learn a lot more than just a great conversation. Let's continue. So we're talking about becoming good at iterating. I want to, I want to make a specific point here in the subject of iteration. The iterative process is, is really simple. Agile is based on it. Agile as a agile software manifesto, but also as the word, if you think about being flexible, being adaptive, it really has to do with what we are seeing here. You plan something and then you do it and then you learn. But learning is adjusting. And, and that's why this is a very, you know, this is a choice of word. Once you learn, something has to change. I will challenge you in your life. Like learning doesn't happen here. That one you, you will forget come a week from now. Learning has to be applied. Something's got to change. It's how we write user stories. It is whatever. It doesn't really matter what it is, but there, there will be something that we will adjust at the end of our iteration. Then we can say that we learn. And it doesn't need to be big, but something, uh, you know, you should create the space for your team. You can actually have that happening every day. You can have that happen at the end of the main product iteration. So at, at the end of a release or at the end of a sprint, if you're in Scrum, but not only there, you can create different moments for learning and, and have that happening. And of course, I have trust here as the bedrock of everything. Again, what we said. So when I trust that my manager We'll remove any blockers. I can plan confidently. When I trust that, you know, the stakeholders really selected the right priorities, man, I'm executing this like there is no tomorrow. Because if I need to make decisions in my day to day, I know what's first, I know what comes second. And, you know, having the trust also that my coach will push me forward to growth. So um, I'll, trust is fundamental to good iterative process, trusting the process itself of adjusting and, and creating a better planning and a better way of doing things. So it's uh, it's something really key. That is really agile in a nutshell here, folks. And, you know, everything else is, is technical practices, but this is agile. And this is basically the, um, I won't get into much detail here, but it's, um, it's the PDSA or the Deming cycle that sometimes is a little bit misunderstood. This is the double loop learning. And that's what you want to get out of here when you're adjusting. You don't want to adjust only how you do things, but you also want to adjust the assumptions that you use for doing things. So you can just, you know, start 
waking up early but there you know if you're if you're the belief that sustain your waking up early is is not that strong the action might fall short or not be very meaningful um let me see if i can come up with like a, a silly example or more like a non-technological example like um you know let's go with some morals here lying is bad yeah people say lies here and there but you know morally speaking lying is not a good thing but kids lie they, they are learning their boundaries. They are pushing things. So kids lie and they could spend their lives lying if you let them uh, unchecked. So usually what happened is mommy could just like, don't lie. And then, you know, they don't, they don't lie. But what they think is like when mom is not around, I can't lie. So, you know, my action is kind of varied in there. But if I experience some sort of transformative experience, it can be from shame or it can be a beautiful learning that tells me, wow, lying is actually... Lying is, no, it's absolutely not, not it's a no-go, don't lie. Now I am transformed. I have a very different assumption. Um, and, and that happens as well in how we do our work, in how we do our plan or execute and adjust. So, you know, like you can force your teams to have the whip limit in there. And they're like, oh yeah, okay. Can't have more than three stories because Petula said so. You know, that only going to work so far. They have to have, so... You are a coach, you as their coach there. They have to have a transformative experience that will let them to see like, wow, I, I really have to stop the madness of accepting work all the time because now they're acting on the belief that my time is valuable and I don't want to be busy. I want to be invested. So I only work on, and here is my, you know, my limit of working progress. That is how we call the, the double loop because I check my results and I understand them to change both how I behave in what I believe in. So that is, a, you know, that that's something that works for the scientific thinking. That That's what brought us penicillin. That is what is creating the, the Mars rubber. So that is really something super powerful. And, and no, empiricism is not the same as the scientific thinking. Agile performance and, and highly competent uh, agile teams are way beyond empiricism. If there's something that you, you are interested in, I'm more than happy to um, create a masterclass for that. The pitfalls have everything to do with the success path. We can talk like, ah, oh, the managers that do this, or I would say forget all that and just think about the success path and when things are not calibrated. So for example, team cupcake. There's a lot of trust there, but they nothing gets measured. It's all fine and festive, great interactions. But since we don't measure, we tend to think that we are way better than we actually are. And we, we are now starting to see things very subjectively. And since there is a ton of trust, we might be left with the impression that we are the most awesomest team on earth. So we don't need no improving. It might sound an exaggeration, but I've had my fair share of team cupcakes. <laughs> so I recommend that you notice, you know, like there is a lot of, there's a lot of trust. We are not really having all that love for measurement. So you'll start seeing what, uh, you know, what deviates there. In fact, you can even just change cupcake for, let's say, shield or armored. And it's actually the same lack of, you know, the same calibration that is wrong, but in a different direction. So suppose an armored team. There is trust, but just inside and not to the outside. I don't trust my manager got my back. I don't believe the stakeholders know what they're asking, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't measure as a protective way of not exposing yourselves and getting hurt. So paying attention to those imbalances is going to be like wait, no, a, a, a huge way for you to understand how to help teams course correct. For example, tons of trust here. We can have a team that did the hardest part, they bonded, right? They, there is trust. The goal is clear, but nobody understands how to work iteratively. So we just, we never change our assumptions, right? So we're never doing this here, never doing this part, never really learning and adjusting. And it takes forever for us to do anything because we, we keep thinking for two months before we deliver anything. And after two months, all you have to show for is a, you know, a document of specification. And it's not uncommon. My client will accept something still when they see here on their phone. You know what? I actually prefer it different. So documentation, everything that is not your working product, it's, you know, like, even if it's a prototype, it's better than nothing. A prototype is still not going to tell you how hard it is to actually implement, but at least you have a, a few steps already cleared with your, with your customer there. So 
ad being adaptive, being flexible really does include operating in an iterative way. Then another example could be the team Fast and Furious. There's a ton of trust, but we don't know where to go. <laughs> so we're going fast in the road to nowhere. Um, and, you know, they are always delivering the wrong thing. And that's why they're so fast, but also so furious. It's not super their fault in a way because they cannot invent their own direction. But at the same time, if there is trust, how come we are not asking, you know, the right questions to, to know that we are working on the, um, on the right things? So I think that this is something that I, I really wanted you to uh, think through on your own, because I find that sometimes when you look at those examples and you can even go, go home and think about your, your teams and see like, uh, you know, are they like uh, super good at, at iterating, but they actually don't like to, to measure. So they always change things. But, you know, not not something that's really powerful to change. So you can you can notice all this, uh, these discrepancies in your in the team that you help. All of this. Why are we talking about this here? A lot of this can be interpreted as the team's got to change. And I hope you are leaving with the notion that it's not about the, the teams per se, but how you would show up as the coach. One thing that you will not do. I know you're not going to do that. It's just leave here and book this one hour session with your team and say, hey, guys, come here. We're going to, you know, let me show you everything that I that I learned recently. That That's not really how it works. But that is a lot that we see today in, uh, you know, in in, in, in the, the speech and the discourse of how, this, especially in the Scrum Master and PO world, but that, you know, you come and you, you volunteer people to do things. But that's not how it works. And I, I want you to consider uh, the, the invitation for something that is called your, your stance or your posture. And I hope I will make sense with this silly example in here, which is imagine you're watching a movie and I'm going to give you three options. You can watch a movie, movie standing, you can watch a movie sitting, and you can watch a movie in a car. Standing, while well, the possibility, yeah, you can do that. Do that at home, because if you do that in the theater, I don't think people will be very happy, right? They will shout at you. They will hate you forever. You're going to be so sad. So um, that is not a good posture for being in the cinema. At home, you can even be dancing, right? Watching a movie and dance. If you're in a car, you can watch a movie when you're safely parked somewhere. But you can, you know, in your iPad, why not? Um, or in a car in movement if you're not the driver. So it's a different posture depending on uh, on the context. So posture is something really uh, important. And when we talk about coaches and team coaches, scrum coach, agile coach, you, you pick your poison. This is something that we really need to start understanding. Uh, all those things that we learn in all those awesome master classes that in webinars that happen everywhere, use that as a transformative piece for you because we can we can be very much in here, right? And we tell the good news to people, and then you know we end up not listening. And I, I get it because when we feel, you know, I, I've been there myself. <laughs> you know, we'll start with the uh, um, nothing that I mentioned here is not something I haven't been through before. So if you get too used to, to telling, in my experience, what what happened here is because you're not comfortable with what happens when you. Stop telling. It was very clear to me. So it, it, it's required to listen to people in order for things to really, to really move, to shape up, and, and, and you know, and, and really be more balanced, and we really be in collaboration. But when I tell, I am in control. When I listen, I have to really humble myself. And if we're all sorts of biases and assumptions that we have, I don't know what makes you operate in which way, but. Um, you know, in my case, I was a super teller. Some people, they actually don't feel, you know, they, they don't feel like they know a lot. And it's the other way around. And they are like the Oracle of Delphi in, in Greece. We are back to ancient Greece now. And they, nobody understands those coaches because they listen a lot. And when they speak, they just drop a, a question kind of like, a, you know, a mic drop or it's kind of like a riddle. So that's absolutely not useful. Like their teams, like people are left wondering, like, what is what is that person's contribution anyway? So it is possible to over rotate here and you have to find a nice little uh, common ground. So my invitation to you is that in order to arrive here, there are three little words that I use a lot. And I think they should be part of your vocabulary. 
uh, even when you frame things, start using these words. I think it's going to be super helpful for you to, to see things differently. Can you offer more? Can I offer an observation? Right? I'm not just telling. I'm, I'm gauging in here. And when I offer an offer, <laughs> already there, you can, you can even tell me no, right? So I don't need to, to tell anything. So there is the invitation. Invite people. Right, so uh, even even use the word in the context um, when you're with people and co-creation. So um, I could show you a recipe, but do you wanna do you wanna co-create a solution for that with me? So start really getting into the mojo of uh, of thinking this way, and if you can even introduce those words to your people, because remember, like I said, the coach doesn't stay forever with the team. You leave them with this way of behaving, all these postures that you brought to the team, they are your gift to your team. You have to absolutely believe it to be a very powerful coach. You know, all those things that we, we're talking here, they, in particular, in this the realm of agile coaching, for those of you who already are, or for those of you who are um, in the, you know, the aspiring ones. And I would say any Scrum Master should fall in this category because that's actually where it all started. These are stances, so like the postures, you know, sitting in the movie versus, uh, um, uh, standing up, watching a movie. You don't teach your people all the time. Not every discussion needs to be facilitated. When people are really lost, just go in and mentor them. Hi, could I show you how, how I've done this before? Will that be helpful? Will that be useful? You're not going to coach people their ears off when they are in the middle of a production issue. But also, it's a lovely retrospective, and you're really going to come here and like uh, and, and start talking about something very specific and not letting the room breathe and people take their own learnings. So these are impor important postures for you to keep in mind, like you really use them as the context ask for it. This one I, I introduce as my own contribution. Your EQ, your emotional intelligence needs to be part of the game. So I really hope for you that uh, you never forget that even though many frameworks exist for thinking about how to coach people. I think EQ is something that you can always add there. So it's my own spin to the stances of the Agile coach. It is possible, though, that for you, you're in the realm here. You're still in the realm of, um, do, I, do I know how to powerfully help people to plan, execute, and adjust? I'll tell you this because I've, you know, when I was a software developer, by the time I was a Scrum Master, um, I was then developing for 14 years. And, you know, XP, the Scrum, I had a couple of appearances in the waterfall uh, environment, but mostly agile stuff. And I was like, I know this, but I didn't know how to help people. I only knew how to tell people what happens in agile planning and how you do user stories. And, but I didn't know how to be in those scenarios. So it's time to plan. What is it that I do there? I, I sit and watch. I ask a bunch of questions. I prepare stuff. What is it that I do? And there are things that you can do that are proactively and in the moment that you do to help your teams execute. And that's called what I call facilitating the iterative work. And that is pretty powerful. And even if you're not here yet to be that wonderful agile coach, it you definitely at some point need to find your comfort in here. And that's how you're really going to feel like, okay, I, you know, I, I can, I, I can make a difference because you will make a difference helping your people really uh, find their ways here. It's not just teaching them what is a, what is a retrospective. It's really creating one that is an experience that it's powerful enough that they want to repeat that at every iteration. It's not annoying them every single day in the daily huddle. And it is like, a, do you notice a few, a couple of things interesting on the board? And then you mention, and then you people are like, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. We should probably, you know, we should probably always ask ourselves that. So those are the things that are really important for you to master, no matter where you are in your journey to becoming a more awesome um, agile coach. To sum up, I invite you to really consider the, the what I call framework neutral agile. Um, it's very, very dear to me. Uh, Agile coaching taught me that. It, it's my gift to you, honestly. And I think the best framework for your client is the one that they create. And you help them get there. You help, you co-create it with them. I love Scrum. I have a book on it. You can get it from free on my website. It works. Scrum is awesome. It just doesn't work everywhere. Scrum was invented by and for early adopters. So it's, it's like this. You invite me to run today. Don't need to tell me the place, the time I'll go. I'm sold. I love running. I'm invested. 
Invite me to woodworking? Eh, not so much. It's a little bit like that. So people who are the early adopters are the first one. They just, you know, they're just in it. Let's go. But for the people who have the constraints of current hierarchical companies and, um, you know, and, and there's a very specific way of operating and they have to have a much slower progression towards iterative work and building that high performance there, you're actually going to cause a lot of noise if you just arrive all happy installing, uh, not even Scrum, but just like Kanban or, you know, a, a framework that's already cooked. It's going to be very, very disturbing. So when you meet your client and you meet your teams where they are, really, you, you have a prime spot for building trust. Use their own drive. They go with them. Like, what is it that you really want to gain? What is the problem you really want to solve? And you might discover that when the hiring manager says, well, the team has a productivity issue. <laughs> As you go into the whole thing, the productivity issue is not with the team. It's with the manager because every other day should change the priorities so that the team has an inventory of tasks never finished. That's the sort of thing that no framework is going to help you tackle. And it's really the experience of, of going through those stances um, that we just touched upon and thinking about the success path that I showed here. That's the sort of thing that I believe will crack the code for you to really be of impact and of service for, um, for your agile teams. So I really do hope that you got a ton of value and uh, we'll definitely see you on, um, on, on the next one. Bye for now.